Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar entitled Climate Change, Migration and Health in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Baltica Cavieses. I am a social epidemiologist. I work at the University of Development as the director of the Intercultural Global Health Center at the Science and Innovation in Medicine uh, Center from Santiago de Chile in a cold spring day. I greet you with much affection. Thank you for your interest in being part of this important seminar. This seminar will be held in Spanish and we have simultaneous interpretation into English. So if you wish to do so, please activate the interpretation. This seminar is organized by four institutions that have decided to come together to continue developing, uh, to continue promoting reflection and evidence-based knowledge around migrate, uh, uh, climate change, migration and health. These institutions are the Global Intercultural Health Center at the University of Development in Chile, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, Columbia University, the USA, the uh, Latin American Hub for Lancet Migration and the Chilean Network of Research in Health and Migration, Rechisa. First of all, uh, we will have a welcome section that will start with a brief uh, health presentation by Dr. Santino Severan. Severoni. Santino Severoni is the director of the Global Health and Migration Program at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. He's a physician, a health economist, and epidemiologist, and he has experience in systems management. He has over 24 years of experience as a senior technical advisor and as an international executive. He has worked for the WHO, governments, NGOs, and foundations in East Africa, the Balkans, Central Asia, and Europe. Since 2011, he has led uh, the WHO's European work on health and migration. And for three years, he has been the director of the Global Health and Migration Program. Haley, please share Santino's video. Thank you. Buenos días, buenas tardes y buenas noches. Bienvenidos a este importante evento que vincula la migración, la salud y el cambio climático. Agradezco sinceramente a los organizadores que han arrojado luz sobre este tema crucial. En el mundo hay unos mil millones de migrantes. Uno de cada ocho personas, alrededor de 181 millones, son migrantes internacionales y otros 82,4 millones son desplazados forzosos, internos y transfronterizos en todo el mundo. En todo el mundo muchos millones siguen siendo apátridas. La crisis climática está acelerando estas tendencias. El Banco Mundial calcula que 143 millones de personas podrían verse obligadas a desplazarse dentro de esos países de aquí a 2050 por los cambios climáticos de lenta aparición como las inundaciones, las sequías, la escasez de alimentos y agua y seguridad en la subida del nivel del mar. La crisis climática está acelerando estas tendencias y amenaza con deshacer los últimos 50 años de progreso en materia de desarrollo, salud mundial y reducción de la pobreza y también con ampliar aún más las desigualdades sanitarias existentes entre las poblaciones y dentro de las mismas. Claramente pone en peligro la consecución de la cobertura sanitaria universal de diversas maneras, entre ellas exacerbando las barreras existentes para acceder a los servicios sanitarios, a menudo cuando más se necesitan. Al igual que en muchas otras crisis, los refugiados y los migrantes, tanto si ya estaban en movimiento como si lo están precisamente por el impacto directo del cambio climático, pueden ser especialmente vulnerables, con necesidades específicas de salud física y mental vinculadas a su exposición a las condiciones climáticas y medioambientales. A menudo se enfrentan a un gran número de riesgos para la salud antes, durante y después de su viaje 
con un acceso a la atención primaria y continuada a la asistencia sanitaria que a menudo se ve interrumpido en tránsito y en esos países por las barreras de acceso, por la escasa capacidad de los sistemas sanitarios para infraestructuras dañadas y por diversos factores de estrés como la inseguridad económica, el abuso, la explotación, la falta de apoyo y no pocas veces la xenofobia. Uh, si bien nadie está a salvo de esos riesgos, a menudo aquellos cuya salud se está viendo perjudicada y en peores condiciones por la crisis climática son las personas que menos contribuyen a las causas uh, y les cuesta protegerse a sí mismos y a su familia frente a las personas en comparación con las personas de países de renta baja y comunidades desfavorecidas. El cambio climático es un desafío sanitario mundial urgente que requiere medidas prioritarias ahora y en las próximas décadas. La OMS se centra en el fortalecimiento de las políticas, prácticas e intervenciones basadas en pruebas a nivel mundial a través de la investigación operativa centrada en la evaluación y la resiliencia del sistema en respuesta al cambio climático y la migración. La OMS apoya la investigación operativa y el establecimiento de agendas de investigación a nivel regional y nacional, centrándose principalmente en la prevención, la preparación y la capacidad de respuesta de los sistemas sanitarios al cambio climático y la migración. Con esta investigación operativa pondremos en marcha una estrategia mundial centrada en el nexo entre salud, migración y cambio climático, a la que seguirán el eh, plan piloto y la aplicación de la estrategia que se produzca en un plazo de tres a cinco años. En el Departamento de Salud y Migración trabajaremos muy estrechamente con países y socios clave como la OIM, ACNUR y otros para adaptarnos y prepararnos para los retos sanitarios que plantea la migración inducida por el cambio climático. El 30 de octubre lanzaremos la primera agenda virtual de acceso global sobre salud, migración y desplazamiento y estamos entusiasmados con la Escuela Global sobre Salud de Refugiados y Migrantes. Este año es la cuarta edición de la Escuela Mundial que se retransmitirá en directo desde Senegal del 27 de noviembre al 1 de diciembre. Les animo a todos a seguir nuestro trabajo sobre la salud de los refugiados y los migrantes y a participar en nuestras próximas actividades para unirse a nosotros en la intensificación de las acciones para no dejar a nadie atrás. Muchas gracias por su atención y les deseo un taller fructífero. Thank you so much, Dr. Santino Severoni, who has kindly uh, prepared this uh, greetings video, especially for this seminar. Now, I would like to take a minute to tell you about the Intercultural Global Center at the University of Development, and I would like to greet you as a direct director together with the schools of medicine and psychology uh, teams around this seminar. This seminar aims to uh, produce knowledge around intercultural global health issues that include several discipline, me, medical disciplines such as medicine, nursery, etc., and also social sciences like sociology, psychology, anthropology around priority topics regarding global health and intercultural and intercultural culturality in Chile, Latin America, and the Caribbean. For over 10 years, we have tried to provide excellent knowledge to help us understand the growing complexity of healthcare globally and also um, in, uh, in order to have modern societies and create practical solutions to tackle the main challenges when it comes to community health and population health in Chile in Latin America. Uh, also, um, considering the theoretical and practical knowledge in other parts of the world and also by providing our Global South perspective. This research center, together with other researchers from throughout the territory, in January of 2021 created the informal collaboration network called, known as the Chilean Network of uh, Migration um, Research, also regarding health. It is open to many researchers working on health and migration and we're also working as of today with Columbia University. We're so grateful to be able to continue reflecting on climate change in our region. Now, 
I would like to invite Cecilia Sorensen from Columbia University to uh, welcome us as well. Cecilia is a director of the Global Consortium on um, Climate and Health Education, University of Columbia. She's an associate professor at the uh, Environmental Science Department. Uh, Melman Public School of Health. She's an associate professor at the Emergency Medicine Department, Irving Medical Center, University of Columbia. Dear Cecilia, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, Báltica. Es maravilloso estar aquí. Muchas gracias a todos y todas los que están aquí de todas partes del mundo. Es un tema tan importante el que vamos a mencionar el día de hoy. Y como dijimos, soy Cecilia Sorensen, trabajo en el Consorcio Global de Educación sobre Clima y Salud. Usamos una red de más de 400 instituciones de capacitación en materia de salud y clima. Trabajamos con socios, ONGs, etcétera, por, para fortalecer la respuesta del sector de salud ante el cambio climático y amenazas a la salud. Sabemos que la migración es un fenómeno causado por el clima en muchas partes del mundo y hay una necesidad urgente de entender mejor Uh, el tema de la salud y otros temas que deben enfrentar los migrantes en nuestros países y entre nuestros países también. Es importante que trabajemos juntos en todo el mundo para construir esta colaboración para poder tener un futuro más seguro para todos los ciudadanos y ciudadanas sin importar de dónde pro, provengan. Nos encanta ser parte de este trabajo. Si quieren más información sobre el consorcio global, pusimos un link en el chat. Eh, comenzamos a trabajar en 2017 luego del Acuerdo de París del Clima y queremos garantizar que 100% de los profesionales de la salud a nivel mundial tengan el conocimiento y destrezas necesarios para prevenir y prepararse para los impactos del clima en la salud, incluidos los migrantes. Y para que puedan entender mejor por qué hay pobres resultados de salud para los migrantes. Así que están todos invitados a unirse al consorcio. Muchas gracias por esta colaboración con este webinario. Thank you so much, dear Cecilia, for the opportunity to work with you uh, in the preparation for this seminar. Now I would like to give the floor to our first panelist. She is our speaker in the next 30 minutes. She will be sharing her perspective, knowledge and experience regarding climate change, migration and health in Latin America. She, this is Carol Rojas from the University of San Jose, Costa Rica. She has over 10 years of experience as an independent consultant and as a teacher and researcher at the University of San Jose, Costa Rica. She's a sociologist and nurse, and she has a master's degree in political sciences awarded by the University of Costa Rica. She's currently a member of the Board of Lands and Migration, uh, Latin American Hub, and also the Network of the Americas for Health Equity, RISE. Dear Carol, thank you so much for accepting this invitation, and we are very pleased to hear uh, what you have to say in the next 30 minutes. Thank you very much for your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Baltica. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's really an honor for me to be here today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's always an honor for me to be to, uh, to address these topics. So thank you to the event organizers, first of all, and thank you to the colleagues from the region. We have been working for a long time together and these sessions are usually very uh, fruitful because we can share our ideas and opinions. Before I begin, I would like to say two things. First of all, I know that we have interpretation, so I might be speaking a bit too fast. Please let me know if that's the case so that I can slow down. And second, I have a bit of a cough. So uh, uh, I might have to stop for a second or something like that, just to take some rest. Today, we will be talking about climate change and migration in Latin America and the Caribbean, some challenges, trends, and urgent needs. Um, when I was invited, 
Uh, this was done through some work I'm doing with some colleagues, including Carolina Batista and Miguel, who uh, who's here today, and you will be listening to him as well, because they will be talking actually about these ideas. So it's important for me to say that this is collaborative work that includes several colleagues. And in this specific case, I am not a climate change expert and actually have worked a lot more on migration and its connection with climate change, but from specifically from a Central American perspective, from a historical perspective mainly, and by integrating other elements that we will develop throughout the presentation. It's very important to have two perspectives. First of all, we need to see in these historical, political and economic connections with the development of, uh, of the region in the Central American region. As Baltica said, I am from Costa Rica and I, I have expertise in this area. But second, we need to remember the, the human face of what we're discussing here today. So that's mainly my perspective. And why is this my method of work? Well, I think that many times we address these topics, but th there's large trends and big numbers, and we lose perspective of who we're talking about, of the human beings behind the figures. And also, um, we, we forget about history, especially in these Latin American processes, the processes that have led to these externalities caused by climate change nowadays. But actually, um, this is uh, the result of many development decades. And, that are, and of course, this also affects inequalities regarding health. And I believe that this is this burden is still carried by the most vulnerable. We clearly know that more than ever, climate change is a major human mobility driver within countries and between countries. This, this happens in the region, mainly in Central America. Uh, because of its uh, geographical position. One of the main reasons for people to uh, go across countries, we need to remember that climate change increases the number of reasons. And, this, and we have some projections. We know that uh, uh, by 2050, we could be talking about 216 million people who are on the move within countries. And for Latin America alone, we will, we will be talking about more than 17 million. So there's a combination of elements uh, that increase the complexity. Um, so the topic becomes multifactorial and complex in the region. And it has to do precisely with violence, inequality, conflict, uh, um, and infectious diseases are also related and they increase in the region. Also, the lack of access to healthcare, uh, poor infrastructure. So it's a vicious cycle of poverty and insecurity that increases vulnerabilities and further contributes to uh, the decision to migrate. It's clear, as I was saying earlier, that if we focus on Latin America and specifically Central America, and there is this connection, these elements are even stronger because they are the ones that lead us to make this decision to emigrate. Every year there are more displaced people because of these environmental disasters that exacerbate humanitarian challenges and affect the most vulnerable regions. But these are not just any regions and this is what we're going to see in the next few year, minutes. It's important to make this connection. When we're talking about Central America, for instance, and we say that disasters are even more serious. 
uh, because of climate change, uh, which is the region we're talking about. Okay, and we need to also determine why we have these uh, deeper connections between poverty, displacement, and what happens with the connection uh, with the territory. So, between Mexico and Central America, we have over 4 million internal migrants. Uh, in relation to climate change, water scarcity, low crop productivity, rising sea levels. So, for instance, take Central America. This is a geographic region where we have access to most countries in between uh, the two oceans. And it's a region that uh, has a lot of agricultural activities. So there are main ch many challenges, uh, for instance, water scarcity. So this, in a way, starts describing these elements that, that uh, are more affected by climate change. Migration flows in Latin America are effectively driven by complex factors, mainly because of violence. We know that but also democratic political instability, mostly in our, in our region. However, there is a significant increase uh, associated with uh, 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 human di um, natural disaster-related displacement. Uh, there has been an increase in human mobility, over 57.5 million migrants are included in this uh, category, including displaced persons and asylum seekers. So over 30% of the world's migrants. And in the last few decades, uh, in the last few years, we've had one of the largest humanitarian crises of forced displacement. And I think that's something we're very familiar with. We should also consider that we should also consider the profile of migrants uh, from Mesoamerica because its composition has changed. In the past, in the 80s, 90s, it was mainly men, but now it's mainly women, or the number of women has increased significantly. And also, we have more uh, people under age, teenagers, boys, girls. They migrate largely as a result of violence, but also because of displacement due to natural disasters. Uh, because of conditions of poverty, exclusion, etc., vulnerability, they cannot stay in their own country. Um, also, there is an increase in international migration. Uh, is, uh, um, when there is interregional migration in Central America in particular, this is historical migration, uh, uh, something worth remembering always, because as analysts, uh, we should also remember what it means when we talk about displacement related to natural disasters in a region, for example, like Central America, where historically interregional migration has existed before the colony, uh, but it was fully related to uh, produc production, ex exchange, and human mobility uh took place or oh, changed after 1820 because we had the new nation states we had new borders they consolidated etc but uh, we need to remember the territorial dimension where survival was always uh considered from this uh, other viewpoint it was mobility associated with uh, it was more temporary migration, um, maybe uh, in relation to crops, exchange, etc. And this is important because the identity is built in this case and also a sense of belonging, of just saying how we uh, live in association with territories, with agricultural practices and historical exchanges. So, in this sense, 
we know that effectively, for instance, Central America is one of the world regions with the highest exposure to natural disaster and climate variability related risks, especially because of their location. Between 2000 and 2018, there were over 261 natural disaster uh, disasters. And this is very important because as this area is so vulnerable to droughts, hurricanes, floods, landslides, earthquakes, etc., uh, uh, this area is affected every year. And this is part of what we have experienced as a region. This is uh, uh, aggravated by climate change and this makes the situation difficult in each country because it's difficult to deal with the consequences entailed for several reasons. So the natural phenomena that constantly impact Central America tend to degrade uh, the resilience of people, in particular in rural and coastal areas where historically, uh, which historically have held much of the poverty and these areas are much more vulnerable in our regions. Also, regarding uh, social determinants of health, in most of these areas, the populations are mainly farmers. And also, we need to remember that some of them are, are fishers. So when it comes to displacement, we know that this migration, that people uh, with low education level migrate and also um, they have a trade that is closely connected to their place of origin. We need to remember that as well as a challenge. Also rainfall, droughts, degradation of the soil, all of this affects the livelihoods of communities. So this uh, together with social factors, economic and cultural factors, they drive migration. Between 1990 and 2011, for instance, El Salvador had one of the largest losses in the region. It was over $6.5 million. And Honduras uh, re, uh, damage and losses in the amount of 80% of its gross of its GDP. So these are very high figures in a region that by itself has significant poverty levels with significant social um, inequality internally. And every year these countries are, are affected by climate change as well, given their location. So this once again affects them even uh, more. And this needs to be understood in this historical perspective, geographic as well, but uh, political as well, social as well, because this helps us understand that the response to climate change needs to be comprehensive and it needs to include these elements. Because if it doesn't, what we are doing is concentrating an inequality that's already happening uh, from other global inequalities, because those that bear the brunt of all this are countries that already have a terrible situation uh, compared to other countries when it comes to economic, social, or political issues. So many people need to flee their places of origin after losing everything in natural disasters. These are climate migrants, whole families. Uh, we will have a look at some of their testimonies now. And they show us how migration around the world depends on the consequences of these hurricanes, uh, storms, floods, etc. For instance, in Latin America and the Caribbean, disasters have caused, for instance, in Brazil, 23.7 million displaced people. And regarding the coastal El Nino affecting mainly Peru and Ecuador, we know that El Nino and La Nina are made worse by climate change. Although this has always prevailed, there are 
significant economic losses for the region. Here we have some figures for Peru and Ecuador between uh, 2017 and 2018 losses of between $3.5 billion and $2.869 billion only in 2020. Uh, you know, in 2020 during the pandemic, ETA and IOTA categories four and five actually devastated Central America with over 7 million people uh, who suffered losses in 10 countries, causing 2.7 million additional displaced people in the region. When we say internal displacements in the countries, there's also interregional displacement and migration that increases mainly towards the United States, the main uh, destination country. Also, we don't have much time, so I would like to have this more human perspective, as I was saying before. We have here Marvin's story. I will be reading very quickly. He's around 30 years old. He has migrated with Karen, his wife, and two children. He lives within uh, in Guatemala. He tells us that when they told them that there was a problem, that the river, uh, river level was increasing. They didn't believe it. We actually, we didn't know that in the western part of the country there were really big storms and a river coming from Honduras and it uh, actually filled the river near his community. I had a host to pull the produce, the corn, the yuca. I was also working as a day laborer to work the fields, to um, sell products as well. Um, I had to, the road where the bus came was also uh, unavailable. We lost the animals, we lost everything. In the area, there is a banana company where I was working with contracts, but in two, but the company collapsed. They fired everyone uh, because there was there were no jobs. So we couldn't stay there. We couldn't work there anymore. How uh, then could I buy the seeds of fertilizer, etc.? And Karen also talks about the difficult time. He says that she says that they could only migrate. My children wanted to eat, and we had nothing. It was very difficult to to survive. Uh, there was no other choice. Uh, going through Mexico was not easy. Now I can give you details, but it's clear that. Uh, we suffered quite a bit. I don't want my children to go through what we are going through. It's very hard for them to live through this again. Who uh, says that the authorities in their country are responsible because they didn't let them know that ETA was coming, as I was telling you before in 2020. Uh, Carlos's story is similar. He says he lost everything he had because of these hurricanes. So he decided to migrate to the United States. But I would like to highlight something in these stories that Carlos tells us, for example, but also Marvin tells us. Although the mountainous area where they lived is not a great area for agriculture, but he could grow some products, coffee, corn, and beans. We lived OK. We had everything we needed, but after the hurricanes, our house collapsed, we lost our land, etc. It's terrible to have nothing from one day to the other. It's like your mind goes, there's nothing to do at the moment. So I decided to migrate uh, to the United States. It was the only way to do so. Um, we're going to uh, analyze why I want to share these stories with you. In Central America, which is one of the main migration corridors, uh, in 2016, there was already 2.36% uh, of the world population, but 7% of the total international migrants. We know that the destination country, as I said, mainly is the United States. Violence, security, poverty, and also family reunification it continues to be important drivers of migration, but this doesn't mean that as we go forward, we're also affecting this displacement because of climate change. But there's something important. Migration is happening in a context with historical, political, economic, and social ties between countries. And I think that this dimension is essential. 
because actually the people that migrate uh, uh, migrate because of natural disasters, but they do not originally want to migrate. I believe that the interregional uh, corridor, Nicaraguans, Panamanians, and other Central Americans are now moving to Costa Rica. And this migration has, has historically been connected with the seasons, especially temporary workers or seasonal workers. But in the last few years, they have changed their behavior. And also because of the political instability of the region. So what should we focus on? Um, I think that the most dramatic situation is that of Central America with four of the seven countries in the region ranked in the top 20 countries most affected by extreme climate events. And there's a reason for that, in particular because of the dry corridor, which covers over 44% of Guatemala's land area and also Honduras, El Salvador and Nicaragua. And that's the most prominent symbol of uh, uh, climate vulnerability in the region. So this region, that place, which is rural, it houses around 11.5 million people who primarily depend on agriculture and that contribute substantially to uh, jobs in our countries. But because of climate change, this is one of the hardest hit areas and this is an area that already by itself has quite a lot of droughts. But, but because of all this, the droughts are now longer and rainfall much more volatile. So this negatively, negatively affects crops. And this also increases the already existing vulnerabilities that uh, are caused by poverty and violence and these social and economic uh, difficulties. So this is a dry corridor. The dry corridor, as you can see on this image, uh, is a crossroads to our Central American countries in the Central American region. And we would say that it, it becomes stronger in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. It's an area that includes a longitudinal axis that includes a series of physical element and social elements. Since 1960, there has been an increase in the frequency of these extreme phenomena. 1960. Why? Because it's very important that this is uh, highly associated with the economic model uh, uh, that uh, dates back to the 1960s and that has to do with ex extensive cattle uh, raising in our countries. This led to uh, forest logging and a significant ecosystem change. So what happens in the dry corridor? Well, uh, the resilience of livelihoods has decreased because now there is higher exposure to poverty and the poorer people are exposed to more natural disasters and violence. And also something which is very important, which I think has to be linked, uh, has to be included in our permanent debate when we analyze the territories and this connection with uh, between climate change and migration. When we analyze the territory, we need to remember that this includes all our Central American countries. And also, historically, we know what uh, these production areas have meant to our countries. And this is where we have the most population. And this has led to economic development as such. <clears throat> so this leads to increased food insecurity. Indeed, food insecurity, as Marvin was saying, um, and also the following story, they said they had nothing to eat. There, there's nothing else for us to do. We've lost our house, our animals, the land. But when we said the land, it, it was like they what they lost was their opportunity 
to grow uh, products. 62% of the households in the dry corridor areas depend on maize, sorghum, bean crops. Historically, these crops um, uh, have fed this population in this area. Actually, 80% of the households uh, depend on this production of basic cereals. But then in this historical look, uh, we have a, a colleague, a researcher from the University of Costa Rica. Uh, he specializes in geography. Uh, it's very important for us to remember this historical dimension uh, when we um, prepare territories, because territories must be considered in our conversations. There are human settlements in Central America uh, in connection with the dry corridor uh, in the ancient period, the colonial period. Uh, for instance, at that time, livestock was introduced as such, because before that it didn't exist. And also productive activities between 1900 and 1960. Uh, this dry corridor already represented to us, well, without the nation states so far, um, this was already a region where our populations concentrated, where we really needed to create the produ necessary production spaces. And there's a reason for this. this the, the Pacific Ocean is close by, the climate was not as harsh as in the Atlantic, um, because uh, there are other lands that are not so hard, uh, not so easy to uh, use for crops, the geography is different, the climate is different. So historically, in our countries, have a look at the map, uh, we can see that the population mainly concentrated on this area and also so this is the dry corridor for production purposes. What happens when the characteristics of the corridor already include some elements that are aggravated? People start losing their land, their livelihood, their productive unit, and they are forced not only in this migration within the country, but into regionally as well, and mainly towards the United States. So we have this dimension related to the territory and also caused by climate change externalities. Therefore, we see a direct impact on countries, both uh, on the country's production and also because migration affects uh, areas that uh, are related to countries that are connected to agriculture and production. And this, uh, in the whole of the Latin American region, jeopardizes their food security. And it's very important to consider that in our region. Have a look at this when we're talking about uh, migrants from El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras and how they were uh, stopped by Mexican authorities and also rainfall averages. Have a look at the years here at the bottom. The drought uh, periods actually match the migrant displacement periods. So half the deported people, <coughs> these are figures from the Mexican immigration authorities, and a study by Food Security Migration Report tells us that half of the people deported were working in agriculture and one third uh, had a, a six years of formal education at least. Um, so we need to consider this and what happens with the challenges that we are facing regarding which other populations uh, that migrate. Something, and to finish, I would like to say the following. When they conducted the study, I think that one of the main elements was that when we have these uh, shocks, uh, families try to, you know, uh, modify their spending and food consumption patterns. However, situations deteriorate and they start behaving in a way that compromises their livelihood and their resilience to cope. 
but most of the respondents in this study migrating it is the last resort uh, for facing the crisis. That is to say, they do everything possible. They reduce their consumption, their expenditures, they uh, take loans. And uh, it, this is very difficult in the region because these debts increase the vulnerability associated with violence and loss of uh, land, sale of household assets in order to salvage what is left, sale of uh, real estate and other assets. But uh, migration is the last strategy. So always in this migration process associated with this loss of the means of production and livelihood, there is also uh, this chasm that has to do with in this shaping of the self and of what identity is, there is terrible mourning because these people need to leave what they know, their countries, and you know, a whole life because they, they know a lot about uh, crops in their territories, etc. This is Johnny's story. Johnny Ovando. He works in, on his farm in Guanacaste, northeast of Costa Rica. It's getting harder and harder every day. Uh, the chickens are dying. It's too hot. The cows are skinny. They have no grass to eat. So they don't produce milk anymore, especially now that the heat is uh, has been pressing and weather forecasts um, um, are not uh, signaling any rains until August. It's too painful to see an animal die when there is nothing you can do and you have no money to save the animals. So I um, this is the other story then that I wanted to share with you. I would like to close by saying that as a researcher and from Central America, I think it's very important um, to consider in our climate change and migration analysis, we need to consider the historical, social, political and economic perspectives. And we need to study economic models that since the 1950s have deepened these impacts in our territories. Nowadays, not only in the 60s with extensive cattle ranching that cost uh, a high impact, but also at the ecosystem level and with concentrations regarding monocultures. Because in our areas, we can also see how the dry corridor is affected. And this, all of this has led to a loss of territory and this has affected populations and also ecosystems. I think it's very important then to analyze this synergy that also causes greater ecosystemic damage and thus also increases climate change. And at the end of the day, it's the most vulnerable populations, the ones that are most affected the most and the ones that are forced to migrate, knowing that is the last option they have. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, dear Carol, for this thorough evidence-based overview. And also such a human presentation about the reality, especially in the Caribbean and Central America regarding the complex and dynamic uh, relationship between climate change, migration and health. Now we'll have two brief five minute comments. First from Teresita Rocha. After the comments, we will have a debate where we can complement the Central American perspective with other territory-based territory and contextual realities uh, from the rest of our beautiful region. This is Teresita Rocha. She is uh, uh, she has a PhD in public health, awarded from the University of California, San Diego. She studies how migration and mobility are associated with mental health and the sexual and reproductive health of those migrating in Chile and Mexico. Uh, dear Teresita, you have the floor. When your time is up, I will be turning on my camera. And if you uh, can't see me, I will interrupt you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and this invitation. And thank you, Carol Rojas, for her very interesting presentation. I would like to focus uh, on some of the uh, 
things she said. I would like to um, focus on Mexico and the relationship between Mexico, the United States and Central America, which is historical, as Carol said. Something essential in climate change is that it knows no geopolitical boundaries. And this is difficult to understand when we develop uh, migration, refu uh, refuge and mobility policies. So one of the most important things about this presentation and this interesting webinar is that we need uh, comprehensive responses because climate change and natural disasters know no borders. This is why it's so relevant to have a comprehensive interregional approach not just for climate change, but also to address forced displacement and also the, the impact on the physical and mental health of the people displaced. As you know, 2023 is said to be the hottest year the world has ever seen. And climate change, as uh, both uh, presenters have said, is related to natural disasters, hurricanes, droughts, intermittent rains, floodings, and the and increased sea levels, to mention a few. In recent decades, climate change has been key or has driven the forced display, the displacement of many people internally and internationally. Some key figures that have already been discussed. According to the Center for uh, Monitoring of Internal Displacement, there are 24 million people displaced for uh, uh, climate re related reasons in the world. And in Mexico and Central America, it's up to 4 million people displaced within the region because of uh, climate change. We need to remember that there is a lack of research, and this is why. Uh, the pre Carol's presentation is so important so that we can uh, actually find out which the tr accurate figures are, especially in Mexico and Central America. It's very difficult to quantify and classify displaced people because there are other elements, political, uh, economic, social elements. Uh, some of the consequences of uh, the these natural disasters in Mexico and Central America have serious social implications and often lead to problems such as evictions and land occupation and also the reorganization of gangs and criminal groups that control certain areas. A key example is Guerrero, a state in the south of Mexico next to Chiapas, very close to the border with Guatemala where criminal groups have taken over their land to grow poppy, for instance. And this means that people need to leave their land because they have no more land uh, to grow and they need to leave. So we need to remember this uh, climate change related uh, forced um, displacement and migration. These are two different things. In forced displacement, people have no other choice. It's not a really a decision, it's a need. Although legally, and this is some food for thought, legally it's difficult for someone to be considered a refugee uh, due to uh, climate change and natural disasters. A number of authors such as Fitzgerald Clark, Milanda, and some Mexico colleagues such as Zia Leon and Arely Palomo have studied this phenomenon and classify people as uh, displaced uh, persons of forced migrants. We need to ask ourselves how many of them would be considered refugees in the countries they go to or within their country. Uh, um, an important fact, Mex Mexico became one of the world's most uh, displaced countries in the world and the the top 10 uh, the the top nationalities are the Honduras Cuba Venezuela and Salvador regarding what Carlos Rojas said now more than ever we need to acknowledge that climate change is the most interconnected uh, phenomenon especially between regions uh, political boundaries are no longer relevant and are blurred. 
we must acknowledge that there is a direct impact on the displacement of people when natural resources are overexploited. And probably those people are displaced uh, and go towards uh, the places where these resources are consumed. Thank you very much, dear Teresita, for this brief and clear presentation, uh, which has complemented Carol's fantastic presentation. Our next commentator is Michael Nieper. He's a global health, humanities and medical studies professor at the Ethics of Medicine Institute, University of Gizet in Germany. As a physician with training in medical history and anthropology, he focuses on health and migration from a social medicine perspective and human rights perspective. Michael or Miguel as we call him, is also the global focal point for the Latin Migration Latin America Board. And he has worked in Latin America and the Caribbean for several decades on health and human rights. Dear Miguel, you have five minutes. Thank you so much for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Baltica. Hopefully you can understand me. I'm so uh, sorry if the sound is not that great. I'm in Sao Paulo in, at, in a hotel and there's noise around me. Hopefully you can understand me. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate here in this webinar. And thank you also so much for uh, to Carol and Teresita. I would like to say a few things about uh, these presentations. Your presentations have been great. I've been talking to Carol about this for some time now. And now I would like to mention two perspectives. Number one, the Lancet migration perspective, because we w want to have an overview of migration and health in Latin America and also in Europe. And the second perspective is that of someone from the north, because Ma uh, Carol mentioned the historical perspective, the economic perspective, this agricultural perspective between the north and the south. I live in Germany and uh, she's living in, and Cecilia lives in the United States. So we are on the other end of the historical colonial hierarchy. And it's important to consider as well when we address these topics. So first of all, I would like to thank Carol for these personal testimonies that are very important because they illustrate, create empathy and help people really show that migration is a last resort for people, especially to us in the north. We need to finally and accept this and, and also be empathetic and create relationships of dignity with the people that have to seek a life outside of their own uh, place of origin and who want to live in the north because the north is where there are more economic possibilities and better pros prospects for them and their families. So we need to acknowledge this. Therefore, we need to pay attention to these experiences uh, as connected with the studies we have seen. Um, second, I would like to talk about the relationship between climate change, migration and health at the political level. Both issues, climate change and migrations, are issues that, at least in the north, many governments, I think in the global south as well, many governments do not want to address these topics. Be and, uh, uh, a political science colleague in the US says, says that there is a mismatch, like our reality does not match our policies, our pol both in international migration, the needs of people's needs, why they migrate. Uh, and as for climate change, we already have a history of 30 to 40 years in the countries that 
uh, emit the most CO, CO2 uh, and these countries completely ignore their responsibilities. And I'm really concerned right now regarding the discussions in Europe and the United States where people don't want to change the economic system that is based on uh, producing and using fossil fuel energy. And they don't want to acknowledge this reality. And the ones that pay the price are especially migrants because they are ignored, they are not considered in the policies, and many times they're not considered even in the research. So we need to really uh, consider this. We need to publish on the issue to draw people's attention to it. Cecilia, myself, and other people who are doing research in uh, universities in the north, we need to include this perspective and talk about climate justice from a human rights perspective and from the global south. Um, as for human rights, uh, this is something else I would like to address. This year we're celebrating the uh, 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the United States and Europe there is this rejection or refusal to um, focus human rights policies. And we need to emphasize that human rights are precisely, uh, uh, have been precisely created for situations like this <clears throat> to address the suffering of people, inequality, etc. And we need to come together to address this humanitarian crisis, for instance, in Central America. And they don't just require only humanitarian uh, solutions. Um, they go far beyond humanitarian aid. They go far beyond the little support that these people get from humanitarian agencies that cannot do everything. They also need a, per a different perspective as refugees displaced by climate change. For instance, in the US and Europe, we need people to work to help our societies prosper. And this is why we need to change our policies, especially in the global north. We need to learn from the south and collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Miguel, for this deep and interesting reflection that invites us to analyze the north and the south and the role that each one has uh, regarding different rights and equity. Thank you very much. Now, let us go on to the last section of the webinar. This is a plenary discussion. We'll be inviting the three speakers. We also have two additional panelists. This will be, this discussion will be moderated by Irene Torres from the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the IAI. Irene is from Ecuador. She's a strategic advisor to the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. She is a member of the advisory uh, committee of the group uh, uh, on fragile and conflict-affected conflict context, global systems. Um, she's also a member of the board of the Ecuadorian Society of Public Health. Dear Irene, thank you for your support, for joining us, and for agreeing to moderate these 25 minutes of constructive debate. We also have Ana Belusio from the NGO uh, Daño, uh, Salud Sin Daño in Argentina. She's a journalist and communicator. She was for media outlets, scientific research organizations, and NGOs. She's interested in environment. She ex the environment, she explores the use of language and information to address the connection between environmental migration and the environment. We also have Eduardo Mesones Alguin from the University of San, Ign San Ignacio Loyola in Peru. He's a surgeon uh, from the National University of Pure in Peru. He has a master's degree in clinical epidemiology uh, awarded by the University of Chile, researcher and coordinator at the Center for Economic and Social uh, Health Research at University of San Ignacio Loyola, Peru. Dear Irene, you have the floor, and for the next 25 minutes, you will be facilitating this debate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Baltica. Welcome, colleagues, uh, panelists. The first question is addressed to Anna about language or discourse around climate change, migration, and health. Do you think we are 
integrating these three elements effectively so that we can address policies, for instance, um, not just talking about the topic, but actually addressing the topic. Thank you so much, Irene. I would like to think that we are on the right track and that we are making a lot of progress. It is true that from communication, we uh, tend to study these phenomena more, uh, how we talk about them, how we can better communicate this to different audiences. Of course, uh, there's still a long way to go in this regard, but I think that we are making progress, first of all, from communication, because we now acknowledge that there are people affected by this phenomena. They have names and they are in reg certain regions and these phenomena have causes and consequences. We should also analyze the information frameworks we use, how we frame a topic when we address it, and also which are the potential consequences when we talk about the people who are uh, climate migrants or forced uh, migrants, how do we talk about them? There's an amazing study that identifies four main frameworks. We, we usually refer to them as victims, um, number one. Number two, threats to security, security in different fields. Three, as, uh, people that adapt, also political subjects of change. And these, uh, there is a reason for all this. When you decide to address them in a way or another, this changes the conversation. So um, we might think that these people are victims or whatever. I think we are making a lot of progress. There are excellent documents that we can uh, refer to. So I would like to say that, yes, we are making a lot of progress. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Carol's work has been amazing. Carol has always pointed to the problem regarding the name and personal history of the migrants. And that's difficult to do, actually. Um, how did you decide and how do you manage to combine your research and the specific examples? And how can the rest of us uh, achieve this as researchers? Well, uh, I believe that, and of course, this is uh, my opinion as a Central American, as a researcher, there is always this objective dimension uh, of how we inhabit the research and how we inhabit uh, uh, how global narratives describe us. I am Costa Rican. I've grown up in Central America. And throughout my training and my experience working in the region, um, one of the most important things I've learned, as Miguel said, and regarding human rights, I think it's difficult when the narratives are built f uh, more from outside. Uh, and also in this position as victims, but also these tend to be ahistorical. And in this sense, it's also important to uh, give a voice to those experiencing the issue because there's something extremely important which we sometimes forget, which has been the productive economic development model that has prevailed in the last decades or uh, quite a few decades, actually. And what this has meant for ecosystems and the environment. And nowadays, there are a lot of shared responsibilities and our countries, our states, are responsible when it comes to depleting these productive sources. So I believe that portraying and including this qualitative dimension leads us to uh, include other elements uh, which sometimes are not reflected in the figures. Uh, the figures are important, but the figures blur all this information. We have huge migration flows 
uh, and other countries feel the pressure to address all this and we understand this of course there are many complex dimensions but uh, Teresita was saying also I agree that it's important to understand this in order to understand that uh, thinking of people as something remembering that migration is a last resort helps us rethink how we solve a problem it also has to do with uh, how we are making public policies and also how we are looking to respond to these problems because this is what uh, undermines the territories and this will lead for sure that uh, there will be no solutions uh, migration will continue so we need to consider this element it's not always the first decision people make there are many factors that make this decision very difficult thank you carol thank you so much Edward, you're a physician and epidemiologist. People always talk about this uh, uh, fine line between how we uh, as doctors worry about the health impacts of climate change and migration or sometimes we don't give enough importance to the health sector response. I feel that in this debate it was good not to have a biomedical perspective but also maybe you think that there should be a, a biomedical component like a health component in these debates well thank you thank you for inviting me to participate in this interesting seminar i think that we need a multidisciplinary uh, approach but of course we need to remember that uh, some elements have been shown to have an impact um, climate change and migration after natural disasters has shown a significant impact on physical health in a way and also on mental health so i think that uh, we need to include the medical a response as well and also in the response fr uh, uh, from the healthcare system towards migrants and also within countries themselves we need to remember mobility not just external migration uh, especially when it's very likely for a Nino phenomenon to occur in the Pacific region in South America we have already had events in the north of Peru and Ecuador. We have colleagues here as well from those countries. El Nino always has an impact and it even leads to mobility within our countries. In 2017, we had a large event which we haven't recovered from yet many people have lost to their homes there's this issue with the informality and unregulated growth of the cities in the country and El Nino with all the rains it uh, brings along um, it has led a lot of people to um, uh, move within the country but it also and to other regions but also led to other diseases diarrheal diseases respiratory diseases also vector-borne diseases we have a tropical area here so also other air mediated diseases such as dengue fever zika chikungunya malaria um, so so we need to remember the medical perspective but also some research in peru and the region have shown the impact on mental health which is not usually assessed the health system is not prepared to uh, see these patients diagnose these patients there is PTSD anxiety depression um, and al also they don't have access to the system 
So I think we should always consider the biomedical approach. The process, of course, if social, economic, it's a health process, but it also has strong implications on the physical and mental health of people. Also, other reports have shown that these are not just the people directly affected by natural disasters. It's not just them who uh, migrate. There are other reasons. For instance, um, in the north of Peru, now vectors grow uh, more profusely because of disasters, and this has led to um, epidemics with high mortality rates. Also, malaria and mental health has been crucial as well. So the system in itself, if it doesn't provide a response, uh, if there are natural phenomena, the disaster is even greater because the, there are also uh, issues with access roads, for instance. People cannot reach the health centers or health facilities because the, because the roads are not accessible, the rivers uh, grow in, uh, in the in the level and this leads to isolation. It's a very interesting issue, but it requires a multidisciplinary approach and we need to remember the, the medical side of all this. Thank you, Edward. Michael, you said that high income countries should, should learn from us. I think we have vast uh, research in the region, so they have a lot to learn from us. However, in the Q&A uh, section, there is a question about the need for countries, um, for the countries that are ultimately, ultimately responsible for global warning to take action. Would you recommend more research, for instance, on which actions high income countries are uh, taking on the effects of their industry and policies in the region. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, of course, we need research, but uh, also policies and we also need good journalists to analyze the situation what countries are doing, their responsibilities, what they, how they act. And we should also analyze what Anna said regarding the narratives, how reality is created, because there are many narratives that disguise action. And in the end, there are no results. So we need research on different levels and we need international collaboration with Global South voices so that the North listens. And I also think that the civil society needs to work uh, on research and journalism and other things. Additionally, we don't need uh, more research to act, especially in the North. We already know that producing CO2 is harmful. We know the consequences. Why do we not act? Do we need more research for that? We know that these huge cars are completely useless. And we don't need research to know that. So to act, you might think, well, what are the main problems? We have the evidence. Let's do something. But many times there is this political discourse, the narratives used to um, take responsibility away and to uh, go on like this and to and this happens in Europe we they tell uh, they tell people that everything is okay your privileges are justified etc and that uh, young people and staff shouldn't complain that much and that's quite a serious problem nowadays especially many countries are going towards the political right, and that's very serious now in Europe and in the United States. Let, let's see what happens in the States in the future, but it's a huge problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. So now this is more of a political debate about the political wins in the region. Um, Teresita. In these presentations, you have talked about a new increase in 
uh, the migration of adolescents and children, women, and this is different from previous waves of migration, interregional migration as well, different from previous waves of migration towards the north. And also these extreme natural events that are now more frequent. Edward talked about El Niño phenomenon, uh, which is uh, close and which will seriously affect some areas in the region. Do you think that we should keep talking about, for instance, vulnerability, poverty and exclusion? We, we are doing this, yes, but what would you add to this debate about research and policy uh, development? Thank you. Thank you, Irene. That's a difficult question. I'll try to provide some ideas. I think it's always important to mention structural factors, as Carol said in her presentation. And that's why it's so difficult in this climate change phenomenon to zoom in just on climate change because it is really it is connected to poverty, violence, uh, for instance, Mexico and Central America, poverty and violence, also many times organized crime, as I was saying. So I think that it's impossible to separate poverty and structural factors. But at the same time, as was said at the beginning regarding the words and what Anna said, there's also victimizing people, re-victimizing people, and that doesn't help. That doesn't, for instance, increase the number of people being recognized as refugees or forced migrants. And we see more and more, as you mentioned, internal and interregional displacement that are growing. And we are not recognizing these people with some kind of humanitarian visa or something like a provisional ID card. And this creates more problems regarding irregularity that in turn lead to poverty again. So it's a very complex, vicious cycle. And um, we've seen this in the Southern Cone, for example, in, in Chile, as Venezuelans enter through unauthorized crossings. And, but in turn, they're going to the north because there are no opportunities in countries like Colombia, Peru and Chile. So it's very important to make a regional effort. Maybe issue a humanitarian visa for some reasons. These are the people who are on the move because we are creating more irregularity and this causes other structural problems that uh, appear once again. Yes, you're spinning like the vicious cycle we must address. It was a living example of why it's so difficult to break away from all this. Baltica, now you have the floor to close this very interesting seminar you have organized. Thank you so much, Irene, Carlo, Mijael, Teresita, Edward, Anna. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your comments, questions, perspectives, knowledge, emails, websites. Thank you so much for being with us. Hopefully, we hope this is the first of many webinars. And we look forward to uh, working with Cecilia Haley and the Columbia uh, University Consortium to facilitate evidence-based, uh, uh, human rights-based, evidence-based spaces of this kind to push towards a common uh, look at public health cooperation in our wonderful region of Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Thank you, Lourdes, for being the interpreter throughout this uh, webinar. Thank you, Haley and Cecilia, who have generously trusted us uh, to jointly organize this webinar. So this is the end of the session. Please remember that this material will be available soon. We will send you a link. I think it's Haley. Haley from Columbia University will be making sure you get the material so that you can disseminate this material in the region and beyond. 
Thank you so much. See you next time.